Hi everyone, this lecture is going to cover chapter 32 and we'll be talking about the spinal column and spinal cord trauma. Here's your list of objectives for the lecture and uh, this lecture is going to cover the anatomy of the spinal column and the spinal cord. Uh, we're going to talk about the common mechanisms of spinal injury, the signs and symptoms of spinal injury, and also the treatment of these patients. So uh, spinal injuries are really among some of the most severe injuries that you'll be managing as an EMT. And what's difficult about spinal injuries is that uh, you're probably going to face the possibility of spinal injuries on most days that you show up to work. Um, they're extremely common in motor vehicle accidents, uh, calls involving uh, assaults and um, falls. And some of the, the less common um, etiologies that you might find would be from things like diving accidents um, or sports accidents, uh, skiing, sledding, um, football, gymnastics, things like that. And uh, the, the patients are predominantly male and young. Um, and uh, I think the, the reason for this is largely just because this particular patient population uh, tends to also be more prone to being in motor vehicle accidents, uh, more prone to be involved in uh, violent assaults and also sports injuries. Um, so it's really your job as an EMT to recognize uh, the injuries that could potentially cause damage to the spinal column or the spinal cord and then provide the appropriate emergency care. Uh, these patients can be challenging because um, you have to be uh, very careful about the way you handle these patients and the way you, you treat them because potentially if you don't handle them correctly, you, you can worsen their injury. Um, you can worsen the spinal cord injury and, and that can result in permanent disability and or death. So it's very important that you understand uh, how to properly treat these patients so that you don't uh, further injure your patients. Let's start out with uh, some anatomy. We're going to go ahead and start out with uh, a review of the nervous system. And to really appreciate the potential severity of um, injuries to the spine, you need to start by understanding the relationship between the nervous system and the different parts of the skeletal system that are most closely related. So that would be the, the skull and the spinal column. And any injury to the spinal column um, has the potential to injure the spinal cord because the spinal cord which you can see um, illustrated here on the right, um, lives uh, within the spinal column. And any single spinal cord injury can affect a multitude of organs and different, different bodily functions. Uh, so overall, the nervous system has uh, two major functions, um, communication and control. And the nervous system allows uh, your brain to communicate with all the organs in your body and you have sensory fibers throughout your body that send messages back to your brain to communicate. And then you have motor fibers that send messages to your muscles for movement. So the spinal uh, cord is responsible for receiving messages um, and perception from your body and then sending messages out to your body um, for, uh, for other uh, functions like muscular control. And then uh, furthermore, if you look on the diagram on the right, you can divide um, the structure of the nervous system into two uh, main divisions. So you have the central nervous system and the central nervous system consists of, of the brain and the entire spinal cord. And then you have the peripheral nervous system which consists of all of the other nerves located outside of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, the spinal cord, so we already talked about these two divisions, this CNS and the peripheral nervous system. Um, but the spinal cord is uh, composed of um, nervous tissue. And the spinal cord directly exits the brain through an opening in the base of the skull. And around the cord um, is a protective sheath called um, the meninges. There's three layers of the meninges, but it's just a protective, there are uh, three protective membranes. Um, that provide uh, essentially some, some cushioning um, because it's filled also with cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And uh, the cord is, is thicker um, near the top and then it narrows as it goes down. So it fills 95% of the 
spinal column or the canal and the cervical uh, vertebrae, which the cervical vertebrae are the ones in your neck, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more in a little bit. And then it will only fill 60% um, of the canal in the lumbar region, <clears throat> which is in your lower back. And then uh, all of the nerves to the trunk and the extremities originate from the spinal cord um, as it goes down in your body. And then, um, like I said a minute ago, the spinal cord carries all of the messages to and from the brain uh, and uh, in between the different parts of the body through these nerve bundles. And functionally, um, you can divide it into to two divisions, the voluntary nervous system, which is all of the muscles that you control, that you can think, I want to move this muscle, and then you can move that muscle. So your arms, your legs, um, and the autonomic ner nervous system is um, the control of all of the involuntary muscles and glands. So the, the muscles that uh, you're really not even aware um, that they're muscles, like within your organs, you have muscles uh, in your stomach, you have muscles in your intestines, um, and uh, a lot of your glands are also controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Um, so the, the part of the skeletal system that is uh, critical for the spinal cord is the spinal column, and uh, it provides that protection to the nervous system and uh, essentially encases the spinal cord. Um, so here's the spinal cord in the middle, and then it's protected by this spinal column here. And uh, the spinal column is made up of 33 uh, different bones, and each one of these is called a vertebrae. So this entire bone here is the vertebrae. And they uh, lie directly on top of each other, like you can see here, and they form a really strong, flexible uh, column. And then uh, each one of these vertebrae is, is connected uh, pretty strongly with a series of ligaments. And the ligaments run um, all in between these bones, and they're not uh, shown in this image, um, but that's what uh, connects the different vertebrae. And then in between each vertebrae is a fluid-filled um, uh, intervertebral disc, or a sac, right here. And um, it's a, a cartilage disc, and it has um, a, it's filled with fluid in the middle, and acts as a shock absorber between the vertebrae. And that can be ruptured as well with injury to the spinal column. And uh, here's a better image of some of the ligaments that I was talking about. Um, so this is just the side view here, but these are all the ligaments, um, this light blue color here, those are the ligaments that are connecting uh, each vertebrae. And here's a ligament here. And there's a series of ligaments. Um, and uh, we talked about the intervertebral discs, but this is also just another view here of the discs. So uh, you have 33 vertebrae, and uh, you need to understand um, how to uh, anatomically divide these vertebrae into sections. And uh, this is very important because um, you have to understand what part of the spine you're assessing and then what part of the, the spinal column is most prone to injury. Uh, the cervical spine is the most commonly injured um, among the sections of the spine, and it consists of um, seven vertebrae. It's here in the neck. And then the next 12 are the thoracic spine, and then five lumbar vertebrae. And then the, um, the sacrum, or the, the sacral uh, section of the spinal cord, is actually fused, and you can see that here. And it's not made up of uh, quite the same vertebrae as the rest of the spinal column. And then the coccyx, um, that's made up of four small bones. It's down here, and uh, that's what uh, people would commonly refer to as your tailbone. I think we covered uh, this slide actually earlier, so just remember that the, the spinal cord extends from the brain all the way down is comprised of nervous tissue um, surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid and uh, narrows as it um, proceeds down to the lumbar region. So uh, the three main tracks of the spinal cord are important for you to understand so that 
um, you can properly evaluate your patient uh, and look for any signs of neurolog neurological damage. And the spinal cord is very complicated with the tracks um, and the way that the nerves run through the spinal cord. Um, but uh, I think we can break it down into three tracks for you to understand. And uh, the first one's gonna be the motor track. And uh, the motor track carries impulses down the spinal cord and out to the muscles. And what's important to understand about the motor track is that um, it's on, uh, so if it's on the right side of the spinal cord, uh, it carries impulses that allow the patient to move on the same side, so on the right side. So um, the nerves run on the same side that it controls. And that's not going to be the same for all of these tracks. And then the, the pain tracks, uh, they carry impulses from pain receptors up to the spinal cord um, and up to the brain. So those are taking uh, messages from the body up to the brain, the opposite direction of the motor tracks. And uh, when they enter the spinal cord, the pain tract uh, crosses over and actually carries the impulse up the opposite side of the spinal cord. So if the pain is being sensed on the left side of the body, it um, eventually is tracked up the right side of the spinal cord. And then you have another tract for light touch which is interesting. So, um, you know, the way you sense pain and light touch are through completely different tracks in your spinal cord. And we'll talk about it in a little bit, but what that means is that, you know, a patient may be able to feel, um, not feel any pain, but they might be able to feel light touch, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, the light touch, again, carries the impulses uh, from the sensory receptors um, up to the brain. And uh, the light touch um, sensation is carried up the same side of the spinal cord as uh, where the touch is being applied. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that you can injure the spinal cord and how these different tracks can be injured. Um, but just big picture, it's just important to remember that uh, all of these nerve impulses are in, in different places in the spinal cord and you can individually injure any one of these tracks um, with the other ones still being intact. And I just want to point out on the diagram on the right, because um, this is an important concept to understand, is what this is showing is what's called dermatomes um, of the nervous system. And let me find an example here. So. Uh, Let's start, let's do C5. So here's C5. And what that's um, indicating is that's your, uh, your, the nerves that control the sensory function on this portion of the body um, connect within the fifth cervical vertebrae. So if you look at these, it's interesting because they don't just cut off like straight across the body. So you're not going to have an issue where the patient says, oh, wow, I can't feel from just exactly from this line down, because that's not really how nerves work. Um, the fifth lumbar portion runs all along here. So it's just an interesting idea to, to understand how these work, these dermatomes work, and that um, you don't typically say, oh, I just lost, I lost sensation from here down through my hand, because if you look at the dermatomes, they don't run in that fashion. Uh, let's work through some of these uh, very common mechanisms of injury. Um, we'll start with uh, a compression injury. And a compression injury occurs when uh, the weight of the body is essentially driven, driven against the head. Um, you're going to see this in um, potentially in a fall if someone were to land directly on their head, um, which is pretty bad luck. Um, but diving accidents is where uh, this is, is very common. Um, motor vehicle crashes, this can happen, especially with unsecured uh, passengers or if the driver is unsecured. And then any other accident where uh, you find out that the patient hit the top of their head first. And what this does is it can, it can fracture the vertebral body here. Um, it is essentially a, a crushing or compression that does that. A flexion injury. Um, this is when there's severe forward movement of the head and uh, where the chin um, is pushed down and meets the chest 
Um, or if the torso is excessively curled forward, you can also have this flexion injury. You can see the injury here, how it's uh, tearing some of the um, connecting um, ligaments and uh, injuring the spinal cord here. Uh, this is an extension injury, uh, which happens anytime you hyperextend the neck. So when the neck is bent uh, severely backwards um, and the neck is stretched out, uh, this can also happen if the, the torso itself is severely arched backwards. Um, so you can have uh, also rotation um, and uh, bending injuries. So rotation injuries happen when there's some type of lateral movement of the head or the spine um, beyond its normal, uh, normal range of motion. And lateral bending is when you have, um, when the body or neck is bent severely from side to side. And then a distraction injury is when the vertebrae and the spinal cord are essentially stretched and pulled apart. Um, this is most commonly going to be seen, seen in, in hanging injuries. So if you were to have a patient that you find out they had an attempted suicide and it was, uh, they, uh, the suicide was attempted by hanging, um, even if uh, you know, they survived the attempt, um, you have to be really mindful of the fact that they may have done uh, injury to their spinal column and their spinal cord and you should take appropriate spinal precautions. And then penetration injuries, um, these are pretty intuitive. Uh, I mean, the injury is wherever the impact is. You can have this from, from gunshots, from stabbings, um, any type of penetrating trauma uh, that involves the spinal column and the spinal cord. So when you have um, an injury to your vertebral column, um, just because you injure the bones doesn't necessarily mean you injure the cord. Um, and then likewise, you can injure the cord without actually fracturing um, the vertebrae. And uh, so 85% of patients who have some type of spinal fracture or dislocation actually don't have a neurological deficit. Um, but uh, so just keep in mind that you can have one injury without the other. And this is one of the reasons that a lot of times um, people can be walking around a scene completely unaware that they have an injury uh, and they might have um, a spinal cord injury that they're unaware of, uh, but they, um, because they don't have a significant fracture to the vertebrae um, or vice versa, they might have a very painful back and a fractured vertebrae, um, but their spinal cord is still intact. This is also part of the reason that um, what you do as an EMT is so important because if a patient has a, a fracture vertebrae but the spinal cord is intact, um, if that's an unstable injury, uh, if, if, they're not, um, if you don't use proper spinal precautions and uh, they further that more, you can end up uh, injuring the spinal cord when it was not initially injured. So uh, any injury to the spinal column is just an injury to one or more of the vertebrae. And these injuries can vary. They can be um, a fracture uh, of the actual vertebral body. Um, you can have a dislocation. Uh, and um, if the patient has an injury to the spinal column, they, they typically complain of pain or tenderness somewhere along the spine when you're palpating it. And just remember, this doesn't necessarily mean the spinal cord has been injured yet. Um, and then a spinal cord injury involves damage to the actual nervous tissue in the spinal cord that's encased within the spinal column. Um, and if you have an injury to the spinal cord, uh, typically you have disruption of one or more of uh, the motor or sensory tracts that we talked about earlier. So this, this results in some type of neurological deficit and that can present as um, you know, loss of motor function where they're, they're, they can't squeeze your hands, they can't move an arm right, they can't move their body correctly. Uh, they can have sensory issues where they're experiencing numbness or tingling, um, lack of pain sensation, lack, they can't feel light touch. Uh, and with an injury to the spinal cord, they may not complain of any pain at all. The diagram on this slide 
um, does a nice job of uh, assigning corresponding injuries with uh, the different portions of the spinal cord and the spinal column. So if you kind of work down on the right, you can see that, you know, basically the higher the injury, um, oftentimes the higher uh, within your body and the more serious the impact of that injury. So um, well, let's break these down by um, cervical, thoracic, and then lumbar and sacral. So for cervical neck injuries, I want you to look at all the things listed here on the right. Um, you can get essentially complete quadriplegia um, with a cervical spine injury. And uh, one of the big problems with this, um, aside from the quadriplegia, is the, the fact that it can affect uh, the patient's ability to breathe because the diaphragm um, is innervated and controlled by um, nerves uh, that connect through the cervical spine. So it's just always, this is one of the reasons it's so important to constantly reassess your patient uh, with a spinal cord injury because if their spinal cord injury worsens, um, they could completely lose control of their diaphragm and uh, you might have an airway emergency. And then the thoracic nerves here, uh, you're more likely to get a paraplegia um, where you know you can the patient can still move their upper body, uh, but they lose control of uh, essentially their trunk and their their legs below. And then injuries at the lumbar nerves and the sacral nerves, um, these uh, have uh, more control over the leg muscles, and then um, something a little more unique where you'll lose uh, potentially bowel and bladder uh, function. Uh, here's a list of some um, kind of unique presentations of spinal cord injuries I want you to be aware of. Uh, one of which I already mentioned was the bowel and the bladder dysfunction. And sometimes this can be, um, this can result in incontinence. So they may lose control of their, their bladder, their bowels, where they um, defecate on themselves or they urinate on themselves. Uh, or it could be the opposite where um, they retain and they, they actually cannot empty their bladder. Uh, sexual dysfunction, they lose uh, control of those nerves, um, and uh, inability to regulate blood pressure. And this is, this is because, it's for a variety of reasons, and we're going to go through this one a little bit more in detail later, but basically uh, your body, um, through injury in the spinal cord, can lose the ability to constrict blood vessels. And remember, that's one of the big ways uh, that we maintain our blood pressure is through dilation and constriction. Um, so making the blood vessel bigger and smaller. And uh, when you can't do that, uh, a lot of times um, you can become very hypotensive with a very low blood pressure. Uh, and then in addition, um, we also, uh, you can lose some control over your ability to stimulate the adrenal glands um, with epinephrine and norepinephrine, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then uh, these patients can also lose the ability to control the temperature of their body. Uh, sometimes they can't sweat with the spinal cord injury. Uh, and um, long-term complications, uh, these patients can definitely have some uh, chronic pain issues. Um, we're going to go through uh, different types of spinal cord injuries. The first one is a complete spinal cord injury. Uh, I think this one kind of speaks for itself, but here you can see the vertebral body here is com completely uh, fractured through and the spinal cord is just obliterated. Um, and this just occurs when, you know, the, the complete cord has been severed. And uh, this is a, a devastating injury. You have total loss of motor control and um, sensory function below the level of the injury. And uh, this is when you will often see that loss of bowel and or bladder control. Um, incomplete spinal cord injuries get very complicated in the ways that they can present. Um, we'll we'll kind of walk through, um, you can see there's three syndromes listed here on the bottom. I'm going to walk through some of the, the common presentations of these so that you understand them. Uh, but these patients can really present in just such a wide variety of ways. And when you have a, a partial spinal cord injury, um, we talked about those tracks um, where you have uh, motor, uh, you have light touch, and you have pain. And uh, these can all be injured in different ways, um, and that can uh, really present an interesting neurological exam. So let's start with um, central cord syndrome. 
And the central cord syndrome, uh, when you look, the red part is the injured part of the spinal cord. So this is just the center of the spinal cord getting injured. And these patients have a, a I don't want to say a cool, but it's kind of, it's a neat presentation because it's so unusual, but um, they present with weakness and paralysis and loss of pain sensation to their upper extremities. And uh, this, this is when the center of the spinal cord in the cervical spine is injured. So just the middle portion of the cervical spine. And um, their lower extremities maintain completely, typically nor normal function. So this patient, you'd say, you know, lift your arms, push against my arms, and they might not be able to do that. Um, or uh, maybe they completely can't move their arms, and when you pinch their shoulder, they can't feel it at all. Um, but they're able to move their legs with full strength. And the reason for this is that the inner portion of the spinal cord in the, um, in the cervical portion uh, carries nerve impulses for the upper extremities, um, and the, the lateral part, the outer part, carries uh, the impulses for the lower extremities. And then anterior cord syndrome is when um, the anterior part, uh, so the front part of the, the spinal uh, cord is injured, and um, this injures the sensory and motor tracts uh, in that portion of the cord. Um, and uh, what's interesting is the part of the cord that's not injured here, the posterior part, is, uh, carries light touch. So light touch remains intact. They can feel light touch. Um, but what they can't feel is uh, they can't feel pain and they might lose motor function. Um, so uh, maybe they, they can't move uh, their legs and you pinch their leg and they can't, they can't feel it. But if you gently touch the skin on their leg, they would be able to feel it. And then brown Saquard syndrome, um, this is uh, injury to a hemisection or a half of the spinal cord. So only half the spinal cord gets injured. And then uh, these patients have uh, motor and sensory loss below the site of the injury, but the, the presentation is on the opposite side of the injury. So on, uh, additionally, you have um, on one side, you lose motor and light touch. And then on the other side, you, you lose pain, uh, pain sensation. And this is because the, the pain tracks cross over uh, after entering the spinal cord and carry the impulse on the opposite side of the cord. Um, so, like I said, these can be very complicated presentations, but um, there's some general patterns that you can learn to recognize, and your book does a really good job of, of going through these if you need to review them again, but um, they're just very interesting uh, spinal cord injuries. And then there's something called spinal shock, and uh, this is basically temporary concussion-like insult to the spinal cord, and uh, it has an effect below the level of the injury. Um, and below the level of the injury, the patient can lose uh, muscle tone, and then uh, they also may lose um, sensation to light touch uh, uh, or pain and be unable to move the extremities um, or voluntary muscles. And then these patients can also present with um, incontinence or priapism and a, a priapism is an involuntary erection of the penis and it's caused by a dilation of the blood vessels below the injury and remember we were talking earlier about um, uh, one of the reasons you have blood pressure issues uh, is because when you damage the nerve that the nerves that allow you to constrict your blood vessels um, all they can do is dilate and uh, that's what causes the priapism and then uh, these patients also might have um, loss of temperature regulation, and they might have hypotension from neurogenic shock. And we'll talk about neurogenic shock more in just a second. Uh, but spinal shock is um, a, a typically a temporary um, condition, and it usually resolves uh, within about 24 hours, but it can actually last up to several days. So you manage these patients um, as uh, someone with a severe spine injury even if you notice that during your exam and during your reassessments, some of the dysfunction uh, starts to resolve. Um, you still need to manage them the same way. Um, one way you can think about spinal shock is to think about it similar to a concussion in the brain, um, uh, just in the way that it's kind of like a temporary uh, insult to the spine. And neurogenic shock, um, it 
uh, can result from injury to either the brain or the spinal cord. And uh, it's from injury to the nerve impulses that innervate the arteries. And without control of your arteries, your body can no longer um, uh, purposefully constrict or dilate your blood vessels. So it can no longer um, relax them or uh, make them, them smaller. And what happens is it causes a relative hypovolemia um, of your, your, of your uh, blood volume. So you're not actually losing blood, but because it just, um, all of your blood vessels dilate, it just kind of pools. And your body can't push it to where it wants, so you lose perfusion to your vital organs. And um, this is really problematic because your blood pressure drops significantly. And uh, this can, can be fatal. Uh, and then the other problem with neurogenic shock is that, you know, so one, you can't control your blood vessels, but two, you can't send impulses to your adrenal gland. And your adrenal gland releases epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these are, are two hormones that um, if, you were, if you're in shock in any other condition and you have low blood pressure, your body stimulates the release of these to help. And you can't do that. So you've lost this compensation. So norepinephrine, the reason that's so important is because that one uh, is released when your body wants to constrict your blood vessels to raise your blood pressure, and you can't. So you have no way to compensate for your, your, your dilated blood vessels. And then epinephrine, um, your body releases this in an effort to increase your heart rate uh, to compensate for the low blood pressure. But again, you can't do that. Uh, and then also you won't be able to sweat because you can't release, um, release these hormones. So um, with the blood pooling in the body and the lack of circulating hormones, the patient's uh, physical signs are very different than what you would see in a patient with hypovolemic shock or shock from hemorrhage. And uh, what you'll see in these patients is the skin is warm because all of, all of the, the blood is kind of pooling outward. So if you feel the extremities, they're going to feel very warm. The skin's going to be dry um, because, like we said, the patient can't sweat. And then their skin may also appear slightly pink or red in color, and it's just kind of flushed from, you, you do have good blood flow out in your extremities because your body can't, uh, can't shunt that to the core. And then the patient's pulse will be surprisingly low. It might be 60 to 100 beats per minute. Um, and typically in a state of shock, if you are in a state of hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock, you would expect a higher heart rate, but you won't see that here. Uh, and treatment of neurogenic shock is really the same as um, for any other type of shock. And um, uh, you need to make sure that you um, go ahead and do uh, C-spine immobilization and uh, keep this patient warm and keep them completely immobilized and transport them. So uh, when you are um, arriving on scene, um, you go through your normal algorithm and you think about during your scene size up, what is the mechanism of injury? And uh, this is incredibly important um, to determine because oftentimes it's the mechanism that gives you the first clue that the patient could have a, a, a spinal injury. Um, always take your uh, BSI precautions, think about how many patients you have on a scene and decide if you need additional resources. Um, and you very well may, especially motor vehicle accidents, if, um, if you need an extrication uh, because of the damage to the vehicle. Uh, here's a list of um, the different types of mechanisms that if you respond to one of these, you should immediately be thinking this patient could have a spinal cord injury. Uh, motorcycle crashes are a really big one. Um, these riders are always ejected from their bike. And even at low speeds, these can be really traumatic accidents. Um, High-speed motor vehicle accidents, um, pedestrian vehicle collisions, so any pedestrian hit by a car, um, they're definitely at risk of a, a spinal injury. Um, significant falls, um, blunt trauma, um, penetrating trauma to the head, neck, or torso. And it's important to do the ne <laughs> neurological exam on these patients to see if they have any deficits. Uh, sports injuries, um, you know, football, hockey, uh, skiing, things like that. Um, hangings, like we talked about, diving, accidents, um, gunshot wounds. Uh, if you were to, you know, a gunshot wound to 
Um, the belly can certainly extend through to the back, so that's why you're always making sure you're doing your neurological exams. And then the unresponsive trauma patient. Um, these are tough because you can't say, can you feel this? Can you move this? Um, so you should always be uh, thinking about injury in these patients and protecting that patient. And then electrical injuries. So the um, general impression of your patient uh, for, for spinal cord injuries um, might not always lead you to suspect a spine injury. Uh, they um, might not appear sick. Uh, they um, might not initially have neurological deficits. Uh, and they might not really be aware that they have a, a spinal cord injury. And that's part of one of the things that makes this challenging because, you know, injuries to other parts of the bodies, it's like a lot of times patients can tell you, I broke my arm, I broke my leg. Um, but a patients usually aren't going to tell you, Ooh, you know, I think I, I think I have damaged the right side of my spinal cord. <laughs> um, so a lot of this responsibility falls on you to recognize that there could be an injury there. And um, a lot of times that is because of the mechanism of action. Um, so if the mechanism of action um, is significant, then you just go ahead and immediately uh, go ahead and get manual inline stabilization, like the um, EMT in this image here, and uh, pay close attention to their exam as you go. And uh, their mental status is important. Um, in these patients, it can range anywhere from being alert and fully oriented to completely unresponsive. So it's very variable. Uh, and then when going through your ABCs, uh, like I talked about a little bit earlier, um, this is something that can deteriorate in these patients um, because of the loss of control over the diaphragm. And it's also important to, to realize in these patients that um, it, you should never do the head tilt chin lift maneuver. Um, if they have a suspected C-spine injury, um, you're always going to want to use the jaw thrust maneuver. And uh, if, if they have secretions or blood in their mouth or need to vomit, then um, suctioning is going to be the way to do that uh, while keeping them um, still protected and immobilized. And then um, assessing their breathing, uh, always being prepared to provide positive pressure ventilation in these patients and supplemental oxygen if needed, uh, keeping an eye on their circulation, uh, noting you know their pulse, their skin color, the temperature of their skin, the condition of their skin, and just keeping in mind the signs of spinal shock that we talked about. And then um, lastly, as always, uh, based on the mechanism of injury in their presentation, you want to go ahead and categorize them as either a high or low priority for transport. Two important parts of your primary assessment are um, assessment of the airway and breathing, and then um, evaluation of the peripheral perfusion of the patient. And um, so for the airway and breathing, Injury to the C3 through C5 um, are where you're going to get into problems with injury to the um, phrenic nerve. And that's the one that I've been talking about that, that innervates and controls the diaphragm. Um, and you can also, uh, the patient can also have issues with the intercostal muscles, um, which also uh, help with breathing um, and are, are really quite necessary for adequate re respiration. So if a patient um, has injured these nerves, uh, what you'll see is they can have really inadequate or even absent breathing. So they might have very little or no movement of the chest wall, and then they could have very slight movement of the abdominal muscles when they're trying to breathe. Um, you could also see really excessive abdominal muscle uh, movement. So there's kind of a variety of ways in which this can present. But this is why it's so important to notice that, you know, one, yes, they're breathing, but are they breathing adequately? Is the rate adequate and is the depth adequate? So just be prepared to provide positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen if you see that the breathing is not adequate. And then also evaluating the patient's peripheral perfusion. Um, they can have an injury to a vertebrae um, and uh, without an injury to the spinal cord and have you know completely normal uh, pulse, skin color, skin temperature, um, and just the general condition of the skin can be completely intact with um, a uh, injury to a vertebrae. But if you injure the spinal cord, um, you can disrupt the transmission of uh, the impulses controlling uh, the blood vessels and uh, that would result in um, uh, blood pressure control issues. 
So you might find that the radial pulse of the patient is really weak or um, even absent uh, due to the reduced blood pressure. And then the skin might be really warm and dry. Uh, sometimes this can be variable where you'll have warm and dry skin below the site of the spinal cord injury. And then above the site, you'll have cool, pale, and moist skin. Uh, that's pretty a rare presentation, but it's just something to keep in mind um, when you're doing your full assessment. And your secondary assessment, um, this is where it's important to do that full head-to-toe exam on these patients. Um, and uh, before you do this exam, of course, you're going to have someone um, immediately holding uh, inline manual stabilization of the C-spine, and that person is not going to release um, stabilization until uh, that patient is in a cervical collar and secured to um, either a, a long spine board or to a stretcher. Um, and when you're doing your exam, um, so you're going to be looking for and palpating for any pain or tenderness along uh, the entire length of the spinal column. So you take your hand and you palpate along each vertebrae and then ask them if they have tenderness when you're palpating. Um, you can also ask them if they, have, um, any, if, if they have any pain even when you're not palpating. And then you can ask them if they had pain when moving um, before they were mobilized. Don't ask them to move. Don't be like, oh, turn your head. You know, does that hurt when you have a very high suspicion of a spinal cord injury? Um, but uh, you can definitely ask them what they experienced um, earlier right after the injury. And then um, you're also going to be asking them if they're alert and able to answer your questions about are you experiencing any numbness? Um, are they having any weakness? Are they feeling any tingling in their extremities um, or loss of sensation? And then uh, you're looking for signs of things such as loss of bowel or bladder control. Um, you're looking for signs of a priapism in a male patient. And then you're always keeping an eye out for any issues with breathing, um, especially breathing that's unusual with very little chest movement or only slight abdominal movement. Uh, and just remember that um, uh, it's very important to communicate with the patient during this process and tell them what you're doing, um, talk them through the exam, and just remind them the importance of not moving their head or their neck. Uh, you don't want the person holding inline stabilization to be constantly fighting with the patient and having the patient try to move. Just communicate with them and uh, usually it goes a lot more smoothly. So we're going to go through some of the different ways that you can evaluate um, some of the, the neurological function of the patient. Um, so this is the um, one of the ways in which you can test the motor function of the upper extremity. Um, if uh, you can do so by having the patient, um, one, hold both arms out and say, uh, don't allow me to push your arms down. And then you push down on their arms. And that's going to evaluate um, C7. And then you can have them uh, grab your fingers and say, squeeze both my hands tight, 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 squeeze them equally and evaluate that. And then in the picture here, um, I think he's, yeah, he's doing, uh, don't let me push your hand down. It's where you stabilize the wrist, you push on the top of the hand, um, and, don't, and you ask them to push against you. This is also a test of C7. And then of the lower extremities, similarly, you want to test that motor function. Um, so what you say is um, have them push up and push down against your hand. Um, so you're going to be uh, testing their, um, their flexion and their dorsiflexion. So in this particular picture, um, the EMT is assessing the plantar flexion. And um, he's saying, pull up against my hand. And that evaluates L5. And then here is the dorsiflexion. So you're having the patient push down against your hand. And that evaluates S1 and S2. And then um, uh, you can also evaluate in these patients um, pain and light touch. And remember that pain and light touch are um, innervated through different tracts in the spinal cord. So the patient may be able to feel pain and not feel light touch and vice versa. Um, so what you can do is uh, you have them typically close their eyes for this exam and you just take like a, a cotton swab um, and use the, the wooden side of the cotton swab to pain them, uh, poke them for a pain response. And um, you're not trying to you know break the skin or inflict significant pain, but 
um, they should be able to feel that. And you say, you know, where do you feel uh, me poking you? And they should be able to say, oh, it's on my foot or it's on my leg. And then uh, do the same thing um, for light touch where you have them close their eyes and you say, which finger am I touching or which toe am I touching? And they should be able to tell you. And then part of your exam, um, a critical part of your exam is gonna be uh, doing the posterior exam. And this is a little more challenging because, um, you know, often these patients are lying on their back but the entire uh, spinal column is on the posterior side of the patient. So you really can't skip this. Uh, so um, the way you're gonna to do this is still have someone hold inline manual stabilization. You do a log roll and then you palpate the entire spine from the C-spine to the sacrum, uh, palpating each and every, every vertebrae and looking for any point tenderness. Um, one of the things that you might find is that uh, they might have uh, very tight muscles around their spinal column or even muscle spasms. And uh, just don't ignore that because, um, you know, some people might be like, oh, that's this patient just has a muscular injury. You know, they're tender in their muscles. They're complaining of pain on the muscles around their spinal column. But this can really be indicative of uh, muscle spasms as a protective mechanism in the body trying to protect the spinal cord or the, the vertebral column, which has um, already been injured. So uh, don't shrug that off as uh, not concerning. That can be a sign sometimes of an injury. And then um, just being emphasized here is that point tenderness is when they have pain and you're palpating on the vertebrae and they indicate that it's painful when you push directly on that vertebrae. Uh, these patients, it, it is definitely always important to get good baseline vital signs during your exam. Um, you're always looking for signs of neurogenic shock. And um, this is, uh, like we talked about, it's the loss of all their sympathetic stimulation um, and uh, dilation of the arteries um, and the inability of your heart rate to increase. So as a result, you get that low blood pressure and then you get a normal or low heart rate. And that's kind of the hallmark of neurogenic shock um, is the low blood pressure and then the normal to low heart rate. And the low blood pressure usually isn't super, super low. Um, it's usually no, no lower than 80. Um, and uh, if, you're seeing, <clears throat> if you're seeing a very low blood pressure <clears throat> in tachycardia, um, so say you have a blood pressure of like 70 over 40 and a heart rate of <clears throat> like 160 or 170, uh, you need to take a step back and start thinking, um, does this patient have bleeding somewhere? Um, because that is not consistent with spinal shock um, or neurogenic shock. Uh, <clears throat> so just always keep an eye out and don't get too distracted by um, the thought of, oh, you know, this is just neurogenic shock and make sure that the vital signs align correctly. Uh, and then a slow heart rate combined with low blood pressure is what you're looking for for um, spinal cord injury. Make sure you always get the thorough sample history. Um, ask them what happened. How were they injured? Uh, ask them very specifically, where do you feel pain? Um, does your neck, your back hurt? Can you move your hands? Can you move your feet? Do you have any abnormal sensations? Do you have numbness? Do you have tingling? And then find out when the pain started. Um, did it start the second they, uh, they had the injury? Did it start a little while later? Um, and then have they been moved since the injury? So uh, if they um, fell off a ladder and um, you know, ask, have, have, have you moved? Have you gotten up? Have you walked around? The same thing for motor vehicle accidents. A lot of times you'll find patients um, away from their car Sometimes they'll be sitting in their car, and if you ask them, have you gotten out of your car, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I walked around for five minutes, and I just came back and sat down. And that's important for you to, to one, to know, and two, to document, to say the patient um, uh, was walking around prior to our arrival. Um, <clears throat> and this is just a, a good review of the signs and symptoms you're looking for. Um, any pain, especially along the spine, uh, the C-spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, um, any tenderness. Uh, when you're palpating the uh, spinal column, you're, you're definitely looking for deformities. This is um, 
not always something that you're going to feel in an injury uh, because remember for you to feel a deformity it has to be a significant fracture or displaced fracture uh, any soft tissue injuries you want to keep an eye out for um, any paralysis inability to move any of the extremities if they compa complain of uh, pain with any movement you need to pay attention to that and then you're always looking for that loss of bowel or bladder control priapism and any breathing issues Uh, one thing to remember in these patients is a lot of these patients have um, multiple other injuries uh, if the mechanism um, was significant enough. So if, uh, for example, in the, in the patient in this picture, um, if they have an injury like that to their lower leg, uh, you need to consider that to be what is considered a, a distracting injury. So if they have that injury, I can guarantee you they're not going to feel a minor fracture. Uh, to their C-spine or their thoracic spine. Uh, so you need to go ahead and despite the fact that they're saying, oh, I don't feel any pain in my back or in my neck, um, it, it, it could very well be because they're so distracted by the other fracture they have and you need to treat it as if they have the potential for a spinal injury. And on reassessment of these patients, a lot of times this is when you're going to get a much more detailed physical exam. Um, this can be a little bit challenging because, um, you know, these patients are going to be um, secured in a, a C collar and they're going to be secured on their back, lying flat on the stretcher in the ambulance. So it can be a little bit difficult to get um, a good exam to the back of the head and, and the posterior side of the patient. But some of that you definitely should have done um, before securing them and during the log roll. Um, so uh, you're going to be performing your ongoing assessment every five minutes en route to the hospital if this is a critical patient. You're going to be keeping an eye on their airway, always making sure their breathing is adequate and they haven't had any changes in their breathing. You're always reassessing their vital signs and looking for any changes or any signs that they might be having some type of neurogenic shock. And you're going to be uh, keeping an eye on their, their pulse rate, their blood pressure, and their skin condition specifically are the key things you're looking at. We, uh, we mentioned these three uh, complications um, before, but uh, just always keep an eye out for the respiratory status, um, any neurological deficits, and uh, their vital signs in the exam. Um, to uh, keep an eye out for inadequate circulation. All right, so let's talk about um, how you actually uh, take care of and treat these patients. Uh, so as a general rule, um, if you have someone with a, um, for example, motor vehicle accident, so, uh, some type of mechanism where you suspect that um, there's a good chance this patient might have a spinal injury, um, if you can, try to approach the patient from the front um, if you approach a patient from the back or from the side and you start talking to them, their natural reaction is going to be to turn their neck and to look at you. And that's, um, that's the opposite of what you want them to do. And then uh, usually a good rule of thumb is immediately as you go up, say, hey, you know, try not to move your, uh, try not to move your head or neck. And then explain to them, I'm going to go ahead and um, hold uh, your head from behind or my partner is going to hold your head from behind. And we just want to keep your head as still as we can and try not to move it and go ahead and establish that manual inline stabilization very early on the, um, in the patient contact. And you want their head to be in a neutral inline position. So um, looking straight forward in a natural position. And if, if the patient, when you, um, when you see them initially has their head pointed in a different direction or in an awkward position, um, if their head does not move easily to the inline position or they complain of any movement when you're any pain when you're trying to move it, um, just go ahead and stabilize the head in the position that you find it. Um, you don't want to force anyone's head into the inline position. If they're complaining of pain, you definitely don't want them to push through that pain. And then uh, don't let go of the inline stabilization until they're secured to um, either a spine board or the stretcher or some type of immobilization uh, device. If they're having an airway issue, um, if they have snoring respirations and you need to open up that airway, uh, just remember that the jaw thrust um, is the maneuver you want to use. Uh, you don't want to do the head tilt chin lift um, because that requires that you bend their neck and move their C-spine and that can cause additional injuries. 
And then uh, you're always going to be managing their airway and breathing um, with uh, the standard devices that you've um, learned of in your uh, airway lectures, uh, especially keeping an eye out for um, uh, making sure their diaphragm is still functioning and, and their respirations are adequate. Um, and then uh, after um, you do the inline stabilization, one of the exam uh, exams you're going to do is palpation of the C-spine, and you want to do that um, before you place on that cervical collar so that you can get a good exam. And then once that's done, uh, you can go ahead and apply the cervical uh, collar for immobilization. And this is usually done uh, during the rapid trauma assessment and um, after assessing the neck. And uh, if your patient um, uh, happens to get nauseous or starts vomiting or has a lot of secretions or blood in their airway, uh, you always want to have your suction available in these patients because uh, these patients can't simply just turn their head to the side and vomit like another patient could. Um, they have to still you know, keep their head straight and then um, oftentimes you're going to have these patients lying completely flat on their back. Um, so the last thing you want is for them to aspirate their vomit um, because you don't have the suction ready. And then uh, for transport of these patients, um, we're going to talk in a little bit of depth about the right way to transport these patients because this is uh, pretty rapidly changed in the way that, um, in the appropriate way to do this. And the old way being that you would always want to put all of these patients on a hard, long spine board, and that's how you wanted to secure them to the stretcher. But um, that that thinking has changed over time, and we'll talk about the reason why. So um, the next the next few slides are going to be based on the North Carolina um, EMS recommendations and protocols. And um, so what the the old recommendation used to be that um, the old thinking was that all patients should be placed on a hard spine board. And the thinking was that, oh, well, we need to completely immobilize the spine. And the only way to do that is to put them on this hard spine board. And uh, they need to stay on that spine board from from the second you load them onto it on scene until they're in the emergency department. But what they found over time is that um, the spine board actually caused uh, more damage than good in most cases. And uh, you'll, you'll see when we do our practical um, skills sessions, but lying on a spine board is very uncomfortable. It's a very hard board. And um, because it's flat, it just it doesn't align with the natural anatomy of the spine. Because if you remember looking at the diagram of the spine, you have a lot of curvature in your spine. So what happens is, especially in older patients, you put them on that hard spine board and they can actually have worsening pain, especially if they have an injury. But even without an injury, they can have pain from having to be placed on the spine board. They can get agitated, anxious, people get claustrophobic. Um, it's a weird feeling having your head taped down, completely immobilized, and your body completely strapped to a board that's uncomfortable. And then um, you can actually have some respiratory compromise uh, just because of the way that um, you're positioned flat on the board. Uh, you're not able to clear your airway secretions. If you were to vomit, there's a big problem. And additionally, you have chest straps. And if those are too tight, you can restrict the movement of the diaphragm. Um, and then um, you can have decreased tissue perfusion at the pressure points. So um, one of the places this can happen is like right at the sacral, uh, the, the sacrum at the sacral uh, bone where it pushes hard against the board and you can get pressure sores. Um, so the general consensus now is that spine boards or um, KEDs, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, should not be the standard uh, protocol for transport of patients and they should not be used during transport of patients to the emergency department um, or during interfacility transfers. Uh, the use of spine boards should be reserved for um, use during extrication of patients or a transfer of patients um, from the, the, the scene of injury to the stretcher or to the ambulance. Um, and they should also be used for patients um, who uh, will need CPR because you can't do CPR on a soft stretcher. Um, so uh, what you can do is a, a lot of times these injuries don't happen in a place that's um, super convenient to the ambulance. Um, so spine boards are still very commonly used as a transport mechanism, um, a way to immobilize a patient. 
uh, until you can get them to the stretcher where they can be um, secured onto the stretcher in a safe way. Uh, one other thing that changed is that um, we used to think that any penetrating trauma to the head, the torso, or the back, um, even if there was just no evidence or, or neurological evidence of a spinal injury, we used to think that you should always um, immobilize these patients on a hard spine board. And uh, that, that changing has shifted to say that um, just because they have a penetrating trauma, like a gunshot wound or a stab wound to the head, torso, or back, uh, does not mean that you necessarily have to um, uh, use spinal motion restriction, but you should base that decision um, on their neurological exam. And if they have any signs or symptoms of any neurological damage, then yes, then you should go ahead and immobilize. But otherwise, it's not necessarily required. Um, and then uh, we started using um, this new term, spinal motion restriction, instead of complete spinal immobilization. Uh, because it's not really accurate to say that we're completely immobilizing the spine. And you'll probably still hear a lot of us use these terms interchangeably, which is fine. But just to understand that uh, the, the correct mo uh, accepted term now is spinal motion restriction, because what you're trying to do is just restrict movement of the spinal column and um, prevent any further damage. But you really can't completely immobilize a patient and say, we're not going to move your spine at all. It's just not realistic. So... Um, current uh, practice for proper spinal motion restriction includes use of a rigid cervical collar, um, the C collar, manual inline stabilization of that patient like we were just talking about, and then um, maintaining spinal alignment with any movement of that patient. So transferring from um, a vehicle to the stretcher or a vehicle to the long spine board or from the long spine board to the stretcher and doing so in a way that maintains spinal alignment and minimizes further damage. And then also securing the patient to the ambulance stretcher for transport. And that's one of the big changes is that um, the accepted practice now is to, you know, even if you move the patient on the long spine board to um, the ambulance, is to go ahead and transfer them from the long spine board to the stretcher, keeping uh, spinal restriction, and keeping the C collar in place with manual inline stabilization and then securing them to uh, the stretcher. Um, so the way to approach um, the treatment of these patients, uh, just go ahead and make sure you're always talking to your patients, explain what you're doing. Uh, this can be very scary for patients and especially with the restricted movement, uh, it makes people really uncomfortable and it just helps if you tell them what you're doing. Um, always checking uh, PMS uh, before and after any immobilization. Always maintaining inline stabilization of that C spine. And always uh, properly patient, placing the patient in the correct size of a C collar. And I'll uh, show you how to size a C collar in just a minute. And then making sure you don't release the manual stabilization until they're secured um, in some way to uh, the stretcher or to the spine board for temporary transport. Um, and then uh, always making sure you're moving the patient using a log roll technique or, um, so that you're keeping uh, the spine in line and securing the patient to the stretcher or the spine board with the straps, um, a head roll and tape. And I'll show you that in a minute as well. And then um, once you secure the patient's body and then you secure their head to the stretcher, you can go ahead and release that manual inline stabilization. Um, so uh, you can see in big red here, because this is the big change uh, that is taking some getting used to, is that once the patient arrives at the stretcher, go ahead and remove the rigid spine board um, while maintaining spinal alignment, and you can use a log roll or a multi-rescuer lift technique. And uh, you do this to <laughs> minimize movement during the transfer. Um, so all of your trauma patients should receive a thorough physical exam, and this exam should always include PMS, pulses, motor, and sensory. And then um, you can use the NSAIDs approach to determine whether the spinal motion restriction uh, protocol is appropriate, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, and then you should always use this um, spinal motion restriction on any at-risk patients. Um, so remember, this includes a C-collar and properly securing them to the stretcher to minimize movement.
And uh, some special patient populations to keep in mind um, who are at increased risk of fracture of their um, vertebrae and, and injury to their spinal cord would be patients with arthritis, um, patients with uh, osteoporosis, with cancer, um, patients who are on, on dialysis for their kidneys. Um, these patients also have uh, um, bones that are, are much weaker than the general population. And then anyone with any underlying spine or bone disease, um, they also need to be treated with extra precautions. Uh, so this is the um, NSAID's uh, approach to determining if you want to go ahead and use spinal motion restriction on a patient. And um, it's a pretty handy algorithm. Uh, you just start over here on the left and say, all right, I, do, I did my neurological exam. Um, and you're like, oh, well, that was, you know, neurologically, they're completely intact. So then you move down here and you think, all right, what was, this, what was the mechanism of injury? And you're like, well, this patient was in um, a, a multi-vehicle accident with an estimated speed of 80 miles per hour and, and um, it was a, a rollover. <laughs> so that would be a significant mechanism of injury. So you shoot over here and you're like, all right, so now I need to go ahead and follow the um, spinal motion restriction protocol. And then you can just keep going down the list here. And if you get no, 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 then you don't have to um, use spinal motion restriction. And some of the other ones um, I want to point out, intoxication. Uh, if your patient is intoxicated, and, and that can be on any type of drugs or alcohol, then you need to go ahead uh, and consider spinal motion restriction because uh, they're not going to be able to adequately engage in a neurological exam. Um, so when you're asking them questions like, are you having numbness or tingling? Um, you know, can you squeeze my hands? Can you lift your arms? Can you push down with your feet? Uh, they might not be able to engage in this exam. And additionally, if they are experiencing um, or should be experiencing pain uh, to some part of their spinal column, uh, they may not be able to tell you or they may not be feeling it because of um, the effects of the drug or alcohol. And then a distracting injury, you treat that similarly. If the patient has a broken femur or broken arm or just some other injury that is, is taking their attention away from the potential to notice some type of uh, pain or discomfort in their back, just go ahead and immobilize those patients. Um, and then uh, the spinal exam is a big one. If uh, Even if the patient doesn't think they have some type of spinal injury, but then you're doing your exam and uh, you push down around you know, C6 on the cervical spine, and they say, oh, yeah, that hurt right on the, right on the, um, the uh, spinous process where you're pushing. That's considered point tenderness, and uh, they do need to have spinal motion restriction. So let's go back. Um, at the end of this algorithm, um, we talked a little bit about how <clears throat> if the patient has point tenderness over the spinous processes, um, that uh, that's an automatic indication for spinal mo uh, motion restriction. Um, but the second part of this is if, if they do not have point tenderness, um, you should also be testing their range of motion. And um, to test their range of motion, uh, this is a passive test. Um, you should not be uh, like physically turning their head side to side or up or down. So what you have the patient do, and, and this is, just remember in this algorithm, this is um, uh, pretty far down the algorithm, so you don't start with this. You wanna think about the other things first before you do this, but um, you have them uh, touch their chin to their chest, so look down. You want them to look up, which extends their neck, and turn their head slowly from side to side, shoulder to shoulder, um, and ask them if they have any pain or discomfort when they do this. Um, if, uh, again, you should not be doing this if you did your exam and they had uh, midline spinal tenderness. And you should definitely not be helping them with any of this motion. And then um, on the bottom of the slide here, um, remember, let's go back to the algorithm. Uh, so if they have a significant mechanism of injury, then you need to immobilize them. So um, here's a list of some of the things that you should uh, immediately consider to be a significant mechanism of injury. Um, any fall from uh, greater than or equal to three feet or greater than or equal to five stairs or steps. A motor vehicle accident that you estimate or that um, is estimated to be at or equal to um, above 30 miles per hour. Any rollover or ejection. 
Um, so that uh, includes anyone um, who uh, was ejected from a motorcycle, a bicycle, um, or any other mobile device, and any pedestrian vehicle crash. Um, if the patient had a diving injury or any other axial load injury, um, so if, if um, their report of the injury is, I, um, I jumped off my roof and I landed on the top of my head, or when I fell, I landed on the top of my head, that's an axial load injury. And then any electrical shock injury. Um, if you're ever in doubt uh, working through that algorithm and doing your assessment of the patient, just go ahead and mobilize the patient. Um, they, can, they can take off the C-collar at the hospital. It's not a big deal. Just always err on the side of caution. So um, the C-collar, let's talk a little bit about the rigid cervical collar. Um, just remember when you put this on a patient, it does not completely immobilize the patient. Um, it's, it's really just a deterrent uh, for them to keep them um, from moving their head and something to remind them that they're not supposed to move their head up or down or move it side to side. Um, and uh, what, what it also does is um, it reduces the compression of the cervical spine uh, during movement as well, providing that little bit of extra protection. Uh, and then um, this does help deter movement of the cervical spine, but uh, it doesn't, um, it shouldn't be used alone by itself. So even say your patient has um, point tenderness to the cervical spine and you're like, well, I don't suspect a thoracic or a lumbar spinal injury. Um, it really, it doesn't matter. You need to use the C collar, but you also need to immobilize the rest of the patient's body um, using uh, the uh, methods that uh, we talked about earlier and securing them to either a spine board or a stretcher and um, doing your best to restrict movement throughout the entire spinal column. Uh, so one of, uh, it's super important to make sure that you choose a C collar that fits the patient. Um, if you use one that's too small, uh, it it won't, it just won't work, um, but you can actually cause additional injury to the patient's um, uh, cervical spine. And if you want, if you, especially if you use one that's too big, it can actually extend the patient's neck and aggravate the injury in that way. So the way that you measure for these is um, you take your, uh, your fingers here, this is where they're measuring. So um, you measure while someone holds inline ma manual stabilization and you put your fingers together and you measure from uh, the bottom of the mandible to the muscles on the lateral um, aspect of the neck. And that's how tall you should adjust the collar to be. And the collars are really easily adjustable. Um, you'll see this in person when you, when you use them. So uh, sometimes you might be applying the cervical collar to a patient that is in the upright sitting position. <clears throat> and this will be common uh, in patients that um, are in the driver's seat or the passenger seat of a car if they haven't gotten out of the car. So the way you do this is you hold um, manual stabilization from behind uh, like this EMT here is doing and then you actually uh, push the um, place the front of the collar up against um, the front of their neck and then wrap the remainder of the collar around and secure it using this piece of velcro here. And then for the patient that's lying down already and is lying on their back, um, you similarly have someone hold manual stabilization from behind. And then you actually slide the back of the collar underneath their neck first. And then after you do that, you can place the front of the collar across the front of their neck and then secure using the Velcro. Uh, so the long spine board, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier being um, a tool that is fallen a little bit out of favor, but still certainly has, um, has its, its place in, in EMS and in patient care. Um, there's a lot of different types of um, long spine boards uh, that you'll see. Um, and uh, these can be used to uh, immobilize the patient in the lying position, a patient who's already lying down, but also the standing position. Um, you could push this up against a, a patient um, while they're standing up and secure them and keep their uh, spine in line um, from that position as well. Uh, 
Uh, so one of the important things to understand in using this long spine board is that, um, you know, when the patient is on here, uh, it really matters the order in which you apply these straps um, and uh, secure their head. So you should always be holding manual um, inline stabilization uh, of their C-spine um, until you have secured the rest of their body and then can then secure their head. Um, and again, these can be used for standing or, or lying patients. Um, and uh, the straps vary for these spine boards. Um, you might see this configuration here, or you might see, uh, this tends to be the more common one that you'll see up here. So um, when you put a patient on the long spine board, um, the order of the straps matters. So the first step is to secure the chest straps, these guys right here. And then after that, you secure um, the hip or pelvis strap which uh, is right around this area of the board. And the configuration can vary, but it's the straps that go over their hips or their pelvis. And then the leg straps down here. And uh, if you need to put padding under their knees or padding anywhere around their body, that's completely acceptable and recommended. And then last, after you secure all of these straps is when you secure the head. Uh, because if you secure the head first, so you tape the head down to the board and they have any movement of their body, all that's going to do is pull and twist on their neck. And that's the last thing you want. So make sure the head is always the last thing that you secure. And this uh, little cute kiddo here, he's in um, a full body uh, immobilization system here. Uh, you probably will not see um, this particular uh, piece of equipment in the field. Um, that would be more in the hospital. Uh, but you could see a patient at home um, with this, uh, this device for sure. And then after you get the patient on the board, remember that um, the current recommendation for uh, transport of the patient is actually to move them off of the board um, using a log roll technique or a similar technique that, that maintains uh, um, inline stabilization and transport them directly on the stretcher, um, not necessarily on the board as is pictured here. Uh, so this device, um, is a device that you definitely need to know how to use, um, but it is not necessarily used by most EMS agencies anymore and has um, tended to fall out of favor a little bit, but uh, it is still very important for you to understand because some agencies do still carry these and there are some unique situations in which they can be helpful. And this is called the uh, KED. It's the Kendrick Extrication Device and it has a whole bunch of straps, but once you figure out how to use it, it's not that hard to use. Um, so what this is for is the extrication of a non-critical patient in the sitting position inside of a, a car. Um, and uh, this can be used for patients who um, can't be removed uh, with um, rapid extrication um, in a manner that uh, maintains proper alignment. And uh, an example of this would be like um, if you had to extricate a patient through a rooftop. Uh, but let me go to the next slide and we'll talk through how to use this. Um, so uh, the steps for using this device is first you always do the manual inline uh, stabilization of the C-spine. Uh, before securing this device, you want to check pulse motor and sensory. You want to go ahead and apply the cervical collar and then take this, uh, this device and position it behind the patient. Let me see if there's a picture here. Uh, there's not a great picture, but basically this is where the head goes and this is where the torso goes. So you slide it down behind the patient and then you secure the middle and the bottom straps first. So these are the ones that are down here, the middle and the bottom ones and then you secure uh, the top strap very loosely. So the middle and bottom ones are very tight and then the top strap you keep loose. And then you secure the, the leg straps, which um, without, showing, without being able to show you right now in person, it's a little bit hard to describe, but there's these straps that loop around the legs. Um, and uh, those are the next ones that you secure. And then place some padding behind the head up here and then secure the head flaps um, using uh, elastic straps that are in the kit or um, tape if you need it. 
and then uh, reassess PMS, pulse motor sensory of the patient, and then you tighten the test chest strap right before moving the patient. And one important thing to remember about the leg straps um, is that once you tighten those leg straps down, they're tightened in the sitting position, which means that when you remove the patient um, from the vehicle, so if you look at the patient here, if the leg straps are tightened on this patient and then you try to lay them flat, their legs are gonna be stuck in the sitting position. So it's something you need to keep an eye on and very quickly release those leg straps um, when you're trying to straighten their legs because they will not be able to push against them to straighten their legs. So once you get this thing secured behind the patient, um, as you see here, you pivot the patient in the car and you pivot them until they can be aligned with a long spine board. And then at that point, you release the leg straps and you loosen the top chest strap and you lay them down onto this long spine board for mobilization. Another uh, technique you need to be familiar with uh, to extricate someone from a vehicle is called rapid extrication. And uh, this, is, this is when um, you use this when you need to get a, car, a person out of the car quickly because they have a critical injury. Um, and uh, you're still doing the very best that you can to maintain uh, stabilization of their spine, but you're doing so um, quicker and uh, a little more urgently than you would if you could just slowly take your time and get them out of the car. Um, there's um, three uh, big reasons you would want to use this, techniques, um, this technique. So one, if the scene is not safe, um, if if the car is on fire or there's a threat of explosion, if there's a chemical spill, um, anything like a, a scene safety issue, like gunfire, something like that, uh, you want to extricate the patient um, quickly. This is the technique that you would use. Um, the second reason is if the patient's condition is just so unstable that you, you have to move them and transport them immediately. Um, for example, if you have an airway issue on a patient, uh, you need to get that patient out of the car uh, and manage that airway, so you would use this technique. And then thirdly, if, if your patient is blocking access to a second critical patient, so if you can't get to the critical patient who's having an airway issue or is unconscious, um, or you suspect has a head injury, then you can use this technique to, to uh, extricate your patient safely to gain access to the critical patient. And again, this should really only be used in these unique situations because um, it uh, does not provide the same degree of cervical immobilization. Here's an example of how you do this. Um, <clears throat> someone still uh, holds inline man manual stabilization. You still apply a C collar and then um, you rotate the patient in the car while maintaining line of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine here and then just rotate them onto a long spine board. And uh, this, this requires a tremendous amount of teamwork and communication, so it's really important that each person knows exactly what their role is. You know, this person needs to understand that that's their job, to hold uh, manual stabilization. And then this person needs to say, this is my job, to go ahead and get that backboard to the correct position to move this patient. So always talk to your partners when doing this. That's very important. Um, let's go over some uh, special circumstances and considerations that you might run into when uh, treating patients with a suspected spinal injury, um, one of which is uh, the issue of helmets. And um, this can present in a variety of situations, uh, one of which is a motorcycle helmet, and that's one that you might have to deal with um, fairly frequently if you're um, working in a city where you're going to be responding to motor vehicle accidents, and uh, two are sports helmets. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that um, the removal of a helmet is not a given and it's something you need to think about before you do because it's not always what's appropriate for the patient and in some situations the right thing to do is to actually leave the helmet in place um, and this is particularly true if uh, the helmet is especially difficult to remove uh, because the removal itself can actually uh, aggravate the spinal injury and cause further damage um, so, uh, when thinking about uh, whether or not you want to remove a helmet on a patient, um, first you want to go ahead and assess the patient's airway and breathing, and think about whether you can adequately control that patient's airway with that helmet in place. 
And if the answer is no, then you should start thinking, all right, how are we going to remove this helmet? Um, and then always look at the fit of the helmet and um, the likelihood of the uh, movement of the patient's head if you were to leave the helmet on. If you can't um, tape down that helmet to the spine board or to the stretcher or get a C-spine and properly, properly mobilize that patient's C-spine, um, then you might have to consider removing that helmet. Um, and then uh, let me go to the next slide. It has a good list. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, a list of reasons that you should leave the helmet in place. Um, if the helmet fits really well, and uh, you think that if you leave the helmet in place, the, the patient's head isn't going to move around inside the helmet, um, then that's a good thing, and uh, you can um, still consider leaving it on. If the patient, um, if their airway is completely intact and you don't have any reason to believe that they have um, impending airway compromise or any type of breathing problem, um, then that's a good thing, and you can consider leaving the helmet. And then if removal of the helmet would cause further damage to the patient. So in looking at the helmet, you're like, wow, this would be a really difficult helmet to get off without pulling and tugging on the patient's head. Uh, then you should consider leaving it in place. And then make sure that you can actually properly immobilize the spine with the helmet in place. If you can't do that, then you need to start considering removal. Um, and then again, this is really one of the critical components here is make sure the helmet does not interfere with your ability to um, assess and reassess the airway and breathing status of your patient. And then here's some reasons why um, you uh, should definitely remove the helmet. So if you look at your patient and uh, you see that I just can't evaluate that airway, I can't access the airway, I can't, I can't control it, then you need to get that helmet off. Um, if you can't adequately control, um, let's see, <laughs> sorry, so those are, though that's in there twice, but, but it's like double important, so that's okay. Um, airway and breathing, if you can't control the airway, then you need to go ahead and remove the helmet. Um, if the helmet doesn't fit well and their head just kind of bounces around inside the helmet, um, uh, then you should probably go ahead and remove it. Um, if, if you still feel like you can't, potentially you could pad around the helmet, um, to try to reduce that movement, that would be fine too. And then if you can't immobilize the spine with the helmet in place, then go ahead and remove it. Um, if your patient is in cardiac arrest, just remove the helmet. You're, you can't run a code. You can't, um, you can't ad adequately ventilate the patient. If your patient is in cardiac arrest, you're going to need to put a bag valve mask on that patient and have really good access to their airway. So just take the helmet off. Uh, if you do decide to remove a helmet, um, a bike helmet's a pretty easy one to take off. Uh, so in the case of a bicycle helmet, what you're going to do is uh, have someone um, do inline manual stabilization here. And then um, while they're doing that, the second rescue or the second EMT is going to go ahead and undo the, the chin strap and um, slowly remove the helmet off the, the head of the patient and doing this um, with as minimal movement as possible. And then from there, you can just apply the seat collar as you normally would. Uh, so football equipment um, can present a, a pretty difficult situation for spinal immobilization, and there's some unique challenges associated with this equipment. Um, generally speaking, the, the injured player is going to be wearing uh, a set of pads um, here, obviously, and then a helmet. And uh, the problem is that um, the shoulder pads uh, elevate the torso and the shoulders of the patient if they're lying flat on their back. And then similarly, the helmet elevates the head. So if both of them are in place, typically the head will be in, in pretty good alignment with the rest of the spine. But if you remove the helmet and leave the pads, what happens is the head falls back and you hyperextend the neck. And then similarly, if you were to remove these pads and leave the helmet in place, then that causes their head to flex forward. And that puts everything out of alignment and uh, creates a really difficult situation for immobilizing the patient. So the general rule is, um, is that uh, unless you have uh, specialized training and how to safely remove this equipment, um, then you need to go ahead and leave the helmet and the pads on and immobilize the patient with both of these pieces of equipment. Um, now, the, um, the one thing that you do need to remove um, always is uh, the face mask. So um, 
this portion here, you need to go ahead and remove it because you need access to the airway. Uh, if you leave that in place and you can't access the airway, then that's, uh, that's problematic. And um, you need to make sure you do that before transport. And in order to do that, um, there's uh, a handful of specialized pieces of equipment that um, the sports medicine trainers might have on scene. Um, but uh, I'll talk in a, a second about some of the ways that you can remove that face mask safely. So like we said, you just leave the shoulder pads and leave the helmet um, because they misalign if you just remove one or the other. And uh, don't remove the helmet unless you absolutely need to. If you need to, then, then go ahead and do it, but um, just don't do that unless it's necessary. And then if you do have to remove the helmet, you have to remove the shoulder pads. So the face mask, um, there's... Uh, this is an example of a pruning tool, and this is probably one of the, the best tools available that you can just buy at a department store um, to remove the, the face mask. And what you're cutting is a, a, a piece of plastic here that um, attaches the cage to the helmet. Um, you can also use a powered cordless screwdriver, um, but uh, most trucks won't have that available. But do not uh, use a regular handheld screwdriver, and do not use trauma shears. Um, both of those take too much time and it just causes too much motion of the head. Um, so one of the safer options is uh, the pruning tool. And then once you cut it off, it just removes like right up off their face and that's pretty straightforward. And here's an, uh, an example of how you would immobilize uh, a player in the full equipment. Um, you're doing it uh, pretty much exactly the same way you would for any other patient where you're strapping the patient's body down first and then um, uh, you're just taping the helmet down to the to the backboard and obviously here one special consideration is that you know this uh, you can't put a c collar on this patient so um, in a lot of ways their equipment is helping to immobilize them you're strapping down um, their chest pads are strapped down they're strapped down and then by, by taping down the helmet, um, it's holding the head in place. When you're dealing with kids that, um, you have and you have suspicion for a spinal injuries, there's a few special considerations that you need to keep in mind. Um, you know, unfortunately, they're not just little adults and anatomically they have some differences that can make um, uh, spinal immobilization a little bit more challenging uh, and one of which is that they're just smaller so uh, you do need to make sure that you have the appropriate size C collar and they make pediatric versions of the C collars um, typically you're not going to have one that's small enough to fit an infant um, so we'll talk in a second about what you do with the infant but um, for smaller children you typically will be able to find one that's fitted right now, if, if you don't have a properly fitting uh, C-collar or um, uh, it's, it's an infant and there's just not the correct size, then what you can do is you can take a towel or a blanket um, or a sheet, and uh, these are always available on, um, on ambulances, and you roll it up. And then with the patient lying on their back, um, essentially you wrap it around from one shoulder around the top of the head and down to the other shoulder and you're um, basically creating a little pocket in which the head lies and then you can uh, tape and secure the head to um, to the, the towel or the roll of blanket providing some stabilization. Um, and uh, a lot of these kids um, for motor vehicle collisions, they, you know, you'll find them hopefully in a car seat. Uh, but maybe not. But um, you really shouldn't use the car seat as an immobiliz immobilization uh, device, and you need to go ahead and remove them uh, from that car seat and get them on a flat surface, um, such as a, a spine board if you're transporting them to the stretcher, um, or just to the stretcher like we've talked about, um, the same way you would transport an adult patient. Um, now, one of the uh, difficulties with um, these young kiddos is that uh, remember that their their heads um, are bigger proportionally than the adult's head to their body. So if you have them lying flat on the stretcher, um, the the large head can kind of cause uh, their neck to flex forward, and then they're not in a natural anatomical resting position at that point. 
So one of the things you have to do is to, to use some padding, um, extra sheets and towels to uh, place that around the patient underneath um, the shoulders of the patient to uh, eliminate the flexion uh, and go ahead and maintain that neutral alignment of the head, the neck, and the spine. Here's an example of how, uh, how you transfer a pediatric patient from a, a car seat onto um, whatever immobilization device you're using. And what you do is you, you lie it um, flat after, of course, you've got manual inline stabilization. And you go ahead and place that seat collar if you have an appropriate size seat collar. And then lay the, the car seat back flat. And then you're just going to um, gently hold the C-spine in line. Your partner is going to hold around the torso and the hips of the patient. And then at the command of the person holding C-spine, you know, say on three, we move one, two, three, and you move together um, all in one gentle motion. It's just a funny comic. All right, so uh, we covered the core content of this lecture, but I want to go through uh, just a few slides with you guys. We're going to do some content review. All right, so I want you to name um, the different sections of the spine and think through those real quick. So it's a cervical, we're going from uh, top to bottom, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. Uh, and then uh, think in your head how many vertebrae are in each one of these regions. Cervical has seven vertebrae, thoracic 12, lumbar five, sacral five, coccyx four, for a total of 33 vertebrae. Uh, nerves travel through the central nervous system from the brain to the spine to which nerves? The peripheral nerves. And true or false, the autonomic nervous system controls the heart rate. True. And what is the most commonly injured region of the spine? It's the cervical spine. And to what region of the spine do the ribs attach? It's the thoracic spine. And then I want you to indicate the type of mechanism of injury for uh, Diving into a pool and striking the bottom. It's a uh, compression fracture or a compression injury, um, but the compression injury uh, can quite often lead to a compression fracture of the vertebrae. Um, the body snapping sideways in a football tackle. That's rotational injury. A person falling down a flight of stairs. A uh, flexion injury, depending on the way they land. A neck injury after being rear-ended at high speed. Extension. Remember, if you get hit from behind, your head snaps back, and that's why you have the headrest. Um, but if the headrest isn't properly adjusted, um, or it's just a, a really high-speed accident, you definitely still can get extension. A uh, person hanging him or herself by a rope. Remember, that's the distraction where it pulls the vertebrae apart. A person stabbed in the back. That's a penetration. And that um, you can also get this type of injury from uh, a bullet wound. Uh, true or false? High cervical spine injury may cause respiratory distress or rest. True, I hope you got that one right. Uh, that is so, so important. True or false, you should check breathing rate and effort before applying a cervical collar. True, you wanna go ahead and assess, uh, assess this beforehand and if you have any emergent uh, airway issues, you need to go ahead and deal with them immediately. True or false, injury to the thoracic spine will cause paralysis of the arms. Uh, that's false. Um, that would be uh, below uh, the torso and you would have uh, likely paralysis of the lower extremities. 
And remember, it's the, the C-spine where you would have um, complete quadriplegia if you were to have a complete spinal cord uh, injury. True or false, tingling sensation in legs in the legs suggest injury to the thoracic spine. It's true. Uh, define paraplegia. I kind of gave this one away just a second ago, but this is loss of function in the legs with uh, full function remaining in the upper extremities. Define quadriplegia, and that's loss of function of both the legs and the arms, and this is most often from that C-spine injury. And then define hemiplegia, and that's loss of function or sensation on one side of the body. And remember, that's, that's from an injury where you have a partial spinal cord injury. True or false, spinal shock results in permanent injury. Uh, that's false. Spinal shock was that temporary one that I wanted you to kind of think about like a concussion. That's a temporary injury, though. I mean, the, the result and the symptoms of that can be quite severe, um, but uh, typically this does resolve on its own. And true or false, priapism is a sign of spinal cord injury. True. And when would you immobilize the head in a non-neutral position? Uh, this is when if the patient goes uh, to turn their head into a neutral position, they complain of any pain or they meet resistance. That's when you want to stop them. Don't force it and go ahead and immobilize it as is. And during which part of the assessment do you check PMS? That's during your rapid trauma assessment. What must you always do before and after immobilizing a patient to a spine board? Check PMS. This is so, so important. You can't forget this. Before immobilizing, check pulses, motor, and sensory. And so you want to check, go ahead and check a radial pulse. Check their motor function. I want to, we need to hear you say, can you wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes? I want to see them move those extremities. And then sensation. This is where you, you touch their hands or you touch their feet and say, can you feel me touching you here? And do that for all four extremities. Distinguish the primary findings between hypovolemia and neurogenic shock. Uh, so remember hypovolemia, you get the low blood pressure and the high heart rate because your body's trying to compensate. And the skin is often cool and clammy because all the blood vessels are locking down to try to shunt all the blood to the core. Neurogenic shock, this is a, the, the kind of strange one. You get the low blood pressure, um, but you have bradycardia or a normal heart rate, which is not what you would expect in most kinds of shock um, because your body can't increase the heart rate because um, you can't send uh, nerve signals to your adrenal gland to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then your skin is also different. It's warm and red, and this is because the blood vessels are dilated, and uh, that's uh, typically below the level of the injury. True, false, cervical spine, cervical collars decrease downward compression on the cervical spine. It's true. That's one of the benefits of the cervical collar. And responsive patients who are in a vehicle should be removed from the vehicle using which device? So a responsive patient who doesn't have an immediate life-threatening injury. Um, any type of vest type immobilization device like the KED. True or false, a cervical collar should be applied before log rolling a patient. True, most definitely. And then you still hold manual stabilization of that C collar while you lo log roll the patient. Uh, when can you release manual inline spinal immobilization? Um, this is going to be after the patient's head has been secured to the spine board or to the stretcher uh, when they're secured to the stretcher. But until then, you need to make sure you, you maintain that inline spinal immobilization. True or false, a head immobilization device and a C collar are the same thing. That's false. Um, remember, the C collar doesn't completely immobilize. Um, the head to the point that it can't be moved. Um, a head immobilization device is something uh, you might see in the hospital setting where it completely prevents movement of the head. Um, so it's not quite the same thing. 
What immobilization procedure should you use when a patient is walking around the scene? So they're already standing up. What do you do with them? Now this is when you do the standing takedown. So you take the, the um, rigid spine board and you have them stand up in a neutral position. Um, they're already standing, but you make sure they're standing in a neutral position with their head facing forward and their feet uh, square. And then you put the spine board behind them and then you secure them to the spine board and gently lower them uh, to a horizontal position. When do you secure the head to a KED? Uh, this is uh, after the torso has been secured. What procedure do you use to get a patient out of a car on fire? That's your rapid extrication and mobilization procedure. And remember, that's the procedure you use if if the patient has an immediate life-threatening injury and you have to get them out quickly or the, um, the car is not safe, the scene isn't safe, or you need to get to a more critical patient. When is it acceptable to not use a vest type device when moving a patient from a vehicle? Um, and this is again, when the patient is in critical condition, there's a danger to the patient or the crew. And that's when you would use the rapid extrication and mobilization procedure. True or false, when performing a rapid extrication manual stabilization, uh, when, sorry, when performing a rapid extrication, manual stabilization is not required. That's false. Um, even though you're going to do this quickly, you still need to do it safely and definitely uh, go ahead and do that manual stabilization of the C-spine. True or false, a helmet should be left in place regardless of the status of the patient on initial assessment. Uh, so that's false. Uh, remember, if, if uh, generally speaking, you want to think, should I take this helmet off or should I not? Don't, don't just assume you want to take it off. And if, uh, if your initial evaluation of the patient shows that they have an airway compromise and you need to get access um, immediately to that airway or, or you think they have an impending airway problem, then uh, that's definitely one of the times that you need to just go ahead and remove the helmet. What indication would require <laughs> removal of the helmet? Oh man, I've given these away as we go. <laughs> Breathing difficulty or apnea? True or false, the airway and breathing can be assessed during the initial assessment with the face mask of the helmet in place. So this is true, and the key here is that this is your initial assessment of the patient. And taking off the face mask is, is not quite as easy uh, done as, as it is said. So um, you can do your initial assessment and assess the airway and breathing, but the key is before you transport that patient, you do need to take off uh, the face mask. True or false, the face mask on a football helmet should always be removed prior to transport. And again, I just gave that away, so that one's definitely true. True or false, if the patient is immobilized with the helmet on, the shoulder pads should be removed. That's false. Remember, if one goes, the other has to go. So if you immobilize the patient with the helmet on, the shoulder pads need to stay in place so you can keep um, the, the torso and the whole spinal column in line with the head. And then similarly, if you remove one of them, you need to remove the other. What action should you take when immobilizing a child to a spine board? Uh, this is when you need to start thinking about padding under the shoulders to maintain that head alignment, because remember, the kiddos have the bigger heads. True or false, when immobilizing infants, C-spine immobilization is not necessary. This is false. Um, the, you might run into some difficulties getting a C-collar that fits, but it's not a big deal. Um, just go ahead and place head rolls on either side of the head and tape. This is when you improvise and use the equipment in your truck. Uh, and that's it for the review. Thanks, everyone.